Uh, Stacy okay. Shear, you've uh, worked yeah. with uh, Tarantino quite a bit. You produced his last movie, Django Unchained. Tell us about producing The Hateful Eight. Uh, what were some of the challenges that presented themselves? Well, obviously the weather was a tremendous challenge. Uh, you know, Mother Nature was constantly throwing us curveballs. We had the warmest winter in the Northwest in the past, I don't know, 100 years. So um, look, they're bringing the poster in. No, they're not bringing the poster in. <laughs> uh, so we were chasing the weather and we were looking to serve the story at the same time. And the weather was a very big part of our story. So everyone had to be tremendously flexible. And that really went from, you know, the top down. Quentin mm -hmm. knew what we needed. And our first AD, Bill Clark, our line producer, Georgia Cacondes, and, and the producing team developed a strategy, which literally was post-its. So we had three <laughs> scenarios that we could go in any direction on any given day now. Were Quentin not flexible and were the actors not extraordinary and the crew this sort of unbelievable machine? We never could have accomplished it, but the three scenarios were if it was sunny, we went into Minnie's haberdashery. That was our cover set. If it was overcast, we went into the stagecoach and it was snowing, we were outside and it didn't matter if we shot seven days, eight days, nine days. We knew we couldn't count on an unlimited amount of snow as had existed in that area in the past. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, it's such a deceptively simple concept for a film, uh, but you add into that the location and uh, the variables like the weather. Um, tell us about uh, finding and building that haberdashery and recreating the period. What were some of the challenges of that? Well, Quentin had a real, of course, like everything, he always has a strong vision in his head. And he and Yohei Taneda, our, our production designer, who's so talented, they had worked on the House of Blue Leaves together in Kill Bill. He had done that section of Kill Bill. And Quentin really knew that one of the things that Bob Richardson and Quentin always talked about with regards to the House of Blue Leaves and Yohei's work is that in any direction that you point at the camera, there was always something interesting and textured there. So that really became um, a center point, knowing that we wanted Yohei to design it. And he designs in a very classical way with illustrations. And Quentin fell in love with minis. And then we had an extraordinary, uh, he had a great team to back him up. Michael Deersing, our, our construction coordinator, um, Richard Johnson, the art director, and Rosemary Brandenburg, the set decorator, they all really worked like a unit, finding things of the period really discovering the personality. It all grew from who Minnie and Sweet Dave were and what this haberdashery was and what it meant to people being in this remote place after the Civil War as a gateway to the West. Mm -hmm. So take us inside of a Quentin set. You know, what, uh, what is the day-to-day -day like working with him and uh, making a movie like this? Well, Jamie Foxx always jokes that there's nothing more joyous than a Quentin set. And there's a tradition that we have um, <laughs> that Jamie actually turned into a song at one point while we were making Django <laughs> that, that he called Tarantino. Um, so when we'll do something particularly elaborate or there are things that he wants the actors to do and the actors all are, they're off book. They are, they're, you know, they're like in the finest Broadway production that they've been performing forever, yet bringing something fresh to the material every single day. Mm -hmm. So when we get it, Quentin will say, okay, guys, we got this. And he says, but we're going to do one more. And the crew says, and then he says, somebody says, why? And then the whole entire crew responds, because we love making movies. Mm -hmm. The other thing about a Quentin set is there's no, there are no phones on the set. There's no iPads, there's no phones, there's no technology. You check all of that with a person before you enter, before you cross the plane of the set. And that creates a completely different atmosphere. You know, it's the 90s for us when we enter into the Tarantino set. People use walkies, people talk to each other. Everybody's focused at the task at hand and joyously. So it's a lot of fun. 
and the crew and the cast and everybody, we really, as corny as it sounds, we really are a family. Mm -hmm. So our readers love all this, uh, you know, behind the scenes stuff. Uh, I wonder, you know, if you could tell us about what was the most, um, you know, maybe difficult day of shooting or, you know, if there was a particular moment that was giving some trouble or you can talk about one of the better days as well. Uh, you know, we just love this sort of behind the scenes stuff. Okay, well, I'll give you one of my favorite little scenarios that we went through. Um, the opening shot of the movie, that extraordinary, um, we refer to him as Jesus the Terrible, you know, the Slavic grizzled giant crucifixion statue that the movie opens on. Mm -hmm. We put it in place. We knew we were getting snow. There hadn't been snow for a very long time. We'd gotten every snow piece, but this most important scene, the opening of the movie. And it had to be right because it was, <clears throat> it had to be right because it was a scene that Quentin had conceived of. It was there in the page. He and Bob had been talking about it for ages. The snow is supposed to hold till about 11 o'clock in the morning. But I'm going to jump back in time to about three days before. Mm -hmm. Three days before, Jesus was put in place and a giant wind blew the statue over and the crucifix fell on top of Jesus and it smashed in a bunch of pieces. Oh my God. And would just five days rushing it to get a new one out there. And it literally was a miracle. The face was missing chunks. They gathered up every piece that they could. The art department painstakingly comped it back together again, aged it, molded it, sculpted it. And we really thought, that's it. It's all over for us. This is the one day we're going to get snow. We're not going to get it. it. It literally was like the resurrection. <laughs> and we got up there. It They had put... They, they reinstalled and, you know, we had to be very mindful about the path to taking this giant two ton crucifix back out into place because we literally had to cover our tracks so that it looked like virgin snow. Mm -hmm. And that that's a big challenge, too. You know, we once had somebody drive down the wrong road and ruin the set for the day. Oh, wow. And um, we got it all into place. We got everything together. And then. Um, they had buried the, they had set up the crane the night before to save time because the snow was supposed to stop at 11 o'clock in the morning. So much snow came overnight because that's a big Telluride pattern where you get a lot of night snow that the weights were frozen. The crane was buried. So then we had to spend all this time heating up the, the bricks, undoing everything. And then, um, Miraculously, it snowed until two o'clock in the afternoon. They knew they got it. It was a very, very complicated shot because you had to move the horses all the way down. You know, the stagecoach starts very mm -hmm. small. And it snowed until two o'clock in the afternoon. We finished all the rest of our snow footage and it did not snow for another six weeks in Colorado. And had we not gotten our footage and gotten out of there, we finished everything we needed to do that day and were able to get on a plane and leave. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, probably still be shooting if it wasn't for that because it was the most important image to Quentin in the entire film right yeah and I mean it, it, it really it typifies the whole nature of the movie which is you know very epic and uh, and grand and um, that whiteout yeah 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 um, lastly I just want to ask you you know you've produced a wide variety of movies and uh, you've been in the business for quite some time uh, you know what is it that 100 years at this point <laughs> um, what is it that uh, drives you as a producer to pick certain uh, materials and, uh, you know, certain films to work on? Well, I'm definitely drawn to story, character, and filmmaker, you know. Um, even in the more comedic things, they're usually more grounded. And uh, I, I've been really blessed to work with Quentin a bunch and Steven Soderbergh a bunch. And I've gotten to work with Oliver Stone and Milos Forman and... Mm -hmm. and it's it's filmmakers character and story and while not everything is going to be excellent i think that the thing that unites me with the people that i tend to work with is that we all strive for that excellence mm -hmm. 
Well, thank you so much and congratulations on the film. And it was a pleasure talking to you. You as well. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. I know that and that.